1 John, the final chapter. And I love this message today. I've titled it, Overcomers and Conquerors. If you are in Jesus Christ, you are an overcomer. You are a conqueror. Let's read our scriptures this morning. It says, Everyone who believes that Jesus is the Christ has been born of God, and everyone who loves the Father loves whoever has been born of Him. By this we know that we love the children of God when we love God and obey His commands. For this is the love of God that we keep his commandments and his commandments are not burdensome for everyone who has been born of God overcomes the world and this is the victory that has overcome the world our faith who is it that overcomes the world except the one who believes that Jesus is the son of God now, that paragraph is just a fancy way of John telling us through the Holy Spirit that Christians are going to win. Christians are going to win. He uses the word, for the word overcome, it's the word nikaio. We get the English word Nike, which was the Greek goddess of victory. So, the word overcomer or the word victory is actually the same Greek word. So John here is talking that we are going to win. Sometimes the same Greek word is called conquer. Now I like both words. I like overcomer and I like conquer and I couldn't decide so I just put them both in there. I like the fact that God sees me as an overcomer. God sees me as a conqueror. Somebody who's going to win. Romans 8.37 says, No, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. Now in the Greek, it's one word there, more than conquerors, hooper nekaio. It means you, you are more than winners because of Jesus who loved us. And I think you know it's important that at the end of life, you win. I told you last week I used to coach my kids in sports, and I coached the boys in football. And you might have heard the statement before, it doesn't matter whether you win or lose, it's how you play the game. And I made some parents frustrated because I told my boys, whoever said that was a sissy. <laughs> because it does matter if you win or if you lose. And every kid knew that, and I know that, and you all know that. It does matter. Now, of course, of course, I always try to teach my kids good sportsmanship. I always, when we did lose, to humble ourselves and congratulate and give them the credit that they played a better game than we did. I get that. But it does matter if you win or if you lose. And I promise you, when it comes to life, when it comes to eternity, it matters whether you win or lose, doesn't it? Jesus said, what does it profit a man if he gains the whole world but loses his soul? So no matter what your accomplishments are in this life, no matter what trophies you win, no matter how good you think you're doing at it, if in the end you lose and you don't have Christ, what does it profit you? Oh my goodness, what a tragedy that awaits people. Who in the, a verse I quote all the time, there's a way that seems right to a man, but in the end it leads to death. How tragic it's gonna be 30 seconds after that person dies and they realize that they have lost. You know the bumper sticker, he who dies with the most toys wins? Should say, he who dies with the most toys loses. 
So we want to make sure we win. And, that, and this, is, this is, man, this is so, these scriptures are so awesome that we, we right here, God's children, we are going to win. We are going to overcome and we are going to conquer. So notice, first of all, in this passage, I want you to see the reaction of an overcomer. The reaction of an overcomer and a conqueror in Jesus Christ. First of all, our, our, the key to it all is faith. The first part of 1 John 5, 1 says, everyone who believes that Jesus is the Christ has been born of God. You got one key that unlocks your front door. I mean, you might have two, but it's the same key. It's a duplicate. That's only that key fits that door. There is only one way to God, and that is, that is having faith in Jesus Christ. If you have faith in Jesus Christ, you are an overcomer. You will conquer all the enemies that come after somebody that is born on this planet. Jesus said this in John 6. They, then they said to him, what must we do to be doing the works of God? And Jesus answered them, this is the work of God, that you believe in him in whom he has sent. What does God want you to do? What are the works required for you to be in God's presence when you die? There's only one thing. It's to believe in the one God has sent. That's it. It's your faith that saves you, your faith alone. There is no other work you can do. Everything else we do as Christians comes because of that faith that's born in our heart. And John says we are now born of God. And that's what motivates us to want to be baptized. That's what motivates us to want to be a part of the church. That's what motivates us to want to study the scriptures. But understand, the only work required is to believe in Jesus. That's a reaction of an overcomer. Another reaction is love. The last part of verse 1 and, and 2 says, And everyone who loves the Father loves whoever has been born of him. By this we know that we love the children of God when we love God and obey his commands. So it's saying everyone that loves the Father, anybody truly loves God, that's what John's book is all about. He wants you to be real. And he's saying if you truly love God and you are born of God, you're going to love anybody else that has been born of him. Why? Because you're a part of the same family. In every, in every normal earthly family, there is a special relationship between the brothers and the sisters. And how much more in the family of God that God calls us to love one another, he's saying, this is how you know you love the Father because you love God's children. You want to be with God's children. That's what Mike was saying. There's so much joy in serving God and serving God's children. So a reaction if somebody is an overcomer, love pours out of your life for God and others. A third reaction is obedience. Verse 3, for this is the love of God that we keep his commandments, and his commandments are not burdensome. Man, when I, when I was a young person, I did not like rules. You want to know why? Because I was rebellious, and rules frustrated me to no end. Especially if, it, if I thought it was a stupid rule, like, I can't die from this bridge. Why can't I die from that bridge? You know? That's God's water, right? <laughs> yeah, I just didn't like rules. 
They were a burden to me. When you come to Christ, when I came to Christ, a person like me that hated rules, when God came in me, I just fell in love with God's rules. Fell in love with them. They weren't burdensome to me. They weren't a problem to me. They were changing my life for the good. I realized it was about grace and God loving me and that, and that God only was doing what was best for me by giving me commands in Scripture. And really, we've looked at 1 John. What are the big commands? What Jesus said, John's been saying you got to believe in Jesus. And then what else does he say? Love each other. I mean, there's the, how many other rules have we heard? So it's about loving God from your heart, loving each other. But if, when, if you're a true overcomer, if you're a true child of God, you, you have a desire to obey God. That's why baptism, it, just, it should be on people's hearts. They, they have that desire to obey. And when we come to church and hear the word of God, we, we shouldn't leave here frustrated we should leave here with joy saying, wow, what God has done for me. And we should just love the scripture and love God's word. As the psalm says, his law is sweeter than honey. And so this is our reaction. We have faith, we have love, and we have obedience. Second thing, I want you to see the results of an overcomer. A result, the results of a conqueror. Verse 4 says, For everyone who has been born of God overcomes the world. And this is the victory that has overcome the world. Our faith. There it is again. It's your faith in Christ. It's your faith in His work. It's your faith in, you're trusting in what He does. You're trusting that He's in control. And because of Christ, you overcome the world. That is a big deal, a big deal. We talked about it in chapter two, that we're not supposed to love the world, and we explain, he's talking about, he's not talking about the flowers, the trees, the animals, he's talking about the world system of self. The world system that we're born into. We're born as sinners, we're born selfish, and we're sucked right into it. And what happens is Jesus Christ rescues us from the world system that has the majority of this world trapped, imprisoned. It's invisible to them, and it's, it's, it's a deception because they don't see it. But oh, is it a big deal that you overcome the world. John 16, Jesus said this, I have said these things to you that in me you may have peace. In the world you will have tribulation, but take heart, I have overcome the world. He's telling us as believers, man, this world, this world, it's a bad place. It will suck you in. It will destroy you. And it'll take you down whatever road you want to go. But Jesus says, I want you to have peace and I want you to take heart. I don't want you to be afraid. I have overcome the world. And what he's saying, because he has overcome, we will overcome too. It's not us working to overcome. It's not us conquering anything else in life. You know, there'll be exercise videos. You want to be an overcomer. You want to be a conqueror. There's marketing videos at your job. You want to be, you want to excel. You want to be an overcomer. It's all based on work, how hard you got to work to be an overcomer or to be a conqueror. Not in God's family. We trust in Christ's work, in his work alone. And that makes us overcome the world. Second thing we overcome, we overcome Satan. Because who's in charge of the world system? 
Satan. Again, folks, this is a big deal. People don't realize that they are under the control of Satan, the Bible says. Jesus told the religious Jews of the day, you're of your father, the devil. The devil has taken you control and you have your self-righteousness and you don't even realize you're blind that you are under the control of Satan. And my, and my friend, if you're under the control of Satan, you are doomed. And there's only one person that can rescue you from Satan. You can't rescue yourself. There is no pastor. There is no priest. There is nobody in this world that can save you from Satan. Only Jesus Christ. He overcomes the world. He came to conquer Satan. Romans 16, 20. I love this verse. Paul says, and the God of peace will soon crush Satan under your feet. And the grace of our Lord Jesus be with you. Oh, Satan, Satan's running wild. Satan's having a heyday right now. But we don't have to be afraid. We have overcome the world. We have overcome Satan. And the Bible tells us that soon God is going to put a stop to Satan and his work. And maybe the best news of it all, we, we overcome death. An overcomer, a conqueror, oh, we overcome death. Isaiah 25, 8. He will swallow up death forever. And the Lord God will wipe away tears from all faces. And the, and the reproach of his people will take away, he will take away from all the earth. For the Lord has spoken. That almost sounds like revelation where it says God will wipe every tear from our eyes. There'll be no more death, no more crying, no more pain. We have overcome death. Folks, that is a big deal. That is a big deal. I love it. And he says, in the reproach of his people, he will take away. Reproach. All the insults. All the ridicule that God's people have faced over the ages for believing in God. All the persecution Christians get. And like I said, that the hatred toward Christianity is growing leaps and bounds today in our world. God says, I'm going to take away that reproach. And, and death will be swallowed up forever for those who overcome, those who conquer. Death hurts. Death hurts. There's no question about it. Paul tells us in 1 Corinthians 15, though, that the poison of death has been taken away, the sting of death. To unbelievers, death is, is a poison. There's no hope. There's no hope for all of eternity. But for Christians, it bites us, but there's no poison. Christ took that poison away. And yes, death still hurts, but we have to hope in the word of God, in the words of Jesus, that we don't have to fear death. Uh, a father and his little girl were walking on the beach, and as they were walking on the beach, there was a dead little seagull laying on the beach. And his little five-year-old daughter had compassion and she went over and she was sad that the little bird had died. And her dad, you know, wanting to comfort her, she, he said to the little girl, he said, this, honey, the seagull went to heaven. And the little girl looked at her dad and said, did God throw him back down? <laughs> be careful what you tell kids they're smarter than you think unless that girl would be confused by that wait a minute the seagull went to heaven why is it laying here dead and I think it's the same with us when we go and we hear scriptures but yet we see a body in the casket we see ashes in a jar and sometimes the enemy whispers, is it really true? Is it really true? And we need to know what Paul says, to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. Our body is still here, 
but our spirit goes to be with Christ. We never really die. And then at the rapture, there'll be a resurrection and our bodies will be raised and we'll have resurrected physical bodies that'll be a lot better than these ones we got now where we don't have to fear death. You know, Jesus said this to Martha. Jesus said this. This is interesting to me. Jesus said this. You would think he would have said this after he raised Lazarus from the dead. He makes this statement when Lazarus is in the tomb, rotting, rotting from decay. And Martha says, yeah, yeah, I know. I know at the resurrection. I know in the last day. But if you were here, you know, my brother wouldn't have died. And Jesus says this to her. I am the resurrection and the life. Whoever believes in me, though he die, yet shall he live. And everyone who lives and believes in me shall never die. Do you believe this, Martha? And it was almost like Lazarus is in a tomb dying, but what is he saying? Lazarus is not dead. Lazarus believed in me, therefore he is very much alive. And I think Jesus did that on purpose so we would know as believers when our loved one dies and they believe in Christ, they never really die. And they're safe in God's presence until God comes again and Jesus comes and resurrects every dead person. So we overcome the world, we overcome Satan, and we overcome death. And then thirdly, I want you to see the rewards of an overcomer. The rewards of an overcomer and a conqueror. There are specific rewards Jesus says he's giving to those that believe in him. These are fascinating. These are good. First of all, 1 John 5, 5 says, Who is it that overcomes the world except the one who believes that Jesus is the Son of God? There it is again. How are you going to overcome? How are you going to conquer? You believe in Jesus. And like I always say, like the old preacher said, a lot of people are going to miss heaven by 18 inches, the distance between your brain and your heart. Some people believe in Jesus up here. They've read the encyclopedia. Jesus is in there. John's talking about believing in Jesus with your heart. And if you believe in Jesus with your heart, you are an overcomer. You are a conqueror. So what are the rewards? Well, we got to go to the book of Revelation. A lot of you missed the study of Revelation, so I'm going to give you a little bit of it right now. In Revelation, John, who's wrote 1 John, he's been sent to the island of Patmos. He's a prisoner. And God wanted him there in his sovereignty. Yes, he did. Why? Because God was going to give him this vision of the future and write the book of Revelation. What's the book of Revelation about? Christians are going to win because Christians were, were losing in that day. They weren't really, but they were being persecuted. They were hiding underground. And so Jesus writes, and he writes to seven specific churches. But the number seven in Revelation is symbolic of perfect and complete. They were seven literal churches, but these promises were for the entire body of Christ throughout everyone that would live throughout church history. So these promises are for us. So he gives these instructions. We don't have time to go through all the churches and all the instructions. You could probably scroll on Facebook and get down and, and look at the Revelation sermons. But I just want to look at the promise that he gives for people that overcome, seven of them. Number one, the tree of life. The tree of life. Revelation 2, 7. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. To the one who conquers. Same Greek word, for overcomer, I will grant to eat of the tree of life, which is, which is in the paradise of God. 
There's coming a day when we're going to eat from the tree of life again. Adam and Eve were banished from eating from the tree of life. It's possibly that that wasn't a punishment. It was that God was protecting them because it seemed that somehow if they ate from the tree of life, it had some kind of power that they would live forever in their sin. But God had another plan called redemption. But whatever this tree of life was, I don't got any video on it. But I want to tell you right now, whatever it was, it was fabulous. It was awesome. And Adam and Eve, before they sinned, got to eat from this tree of life. And this tree of life was taken away. And guess where it is now? It was transplanted, and it's in heaven. And it's going to be in the city of God. And you're going to eat from that tree of life. And it's got some heavenly zip to it, let me tell you. Heavenly zip. And this is, if you are are a believer in Christ, you will eat from that tree of life again. Number two, you'll have eternal life. Eternal life. Remember, this is life abundantly. Sometimes we talk about eternal life and we just think it's living a long time. No, it's... It's more than just living a long time. It's more than just living forever. It's really living forever in the abundance, in the, in the presence of God. And we'll see that as we go through these. Revelation 2.11, he who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. The one who conquers will not be hurt by the second death. The second death. What is the second death? Your first death is your physical death. The second death is your spiritual death when you're separated from God for all of eternity because you went out into eternity with sins. But to an overcomer, to a conqueror, we won't be hurt by the second death because of Christ Jesus, because Jesus is our righteousness. He took our sins upon himself so we will experience eternal life. Number three, a reward we'll get. We get the bread of life. Revelation 2, 17, he who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches, to the one who conquers. I will give some of the hidden manna And I will give him a white stone with a new name written on that stone that no one knows except the one who receives it. Now, the bread of life is Jesus, of course. Jesus talked about the manna. He goes, yeah, you guys know about that manna. Listen, I'm the bread from heaven. I'm really what you're looking for. Nothing is going to satisfy your soul except for me. Jesus is the only way to satisfy the hunger for your soul, the thirst for your soul. And people try to quench it with so many other things. But the only thing that gives nourishment to the soul is the bread of life, Jesus Christ. So that hidden manna, that's just symbolic. It's hidden to unbelievers. It's hidden. Unbelievers won't ever eat from the bread of life. They won't experience that spiritually, God's spirit. They won't experience fellowship with him in heaven. So it's hidden, but it's not hidden to us. That's why we get it. He says, I will give him a white stone with a new name written on it that no one knows except the one who receives it. Now, I hope you don't think I'm going to tell you what it is because no one knows, right? (laughs) But the idea is this. In the ancient times, white stones, it would be like a way that you would get into the arena. You, you could, you'd get into the Olympics or whatever. You'd have a certain white stone. That's like your ticket. And it, it, it meant that you had special privileges. They used it in all kinds of things. So the point is, symbolically, God is saying, I'm going to give you special privileges. And the idea of a new name is... It's, it's referring to a new relationship you're going to have with Christ. You know, right now we come and we sing to God, but he's invisible. We, we can't look at him. We can't touch him. We can't really talk to him. You know, we, we pray to him, but it's, 
It's just there's something that we're missing. And so Jesus is trying to say, I'm telling you, there's coming a day when the relationship between me and you is going to be special. And he's, at, and he's telling us that everyone's going to get this. Every believer. And I think some of you think we're going to be up there like sheep. You know, we can't move. We're all in heaven. What are we doing? Oh, I'm in the back. I can't see. Oh, I was a terrible Christian. I'm out in the back, man. I'm never going to get to see Jesus for all of eternity. No, it's saying that every single believer is going to have a special relationship with Christ. You're going to know him personally. That's what it's saying if you're an overcomer, if you're a conqueror. Number four, you receive the light of life. Revelation 2, 26, and the one who conquers and who keeps my works till, till the end, to him I will give authority over the nations. And he will rule them with a rod of iron, as when earthen pots are broken in pieces, even as I myself have received authority from my Father. And I will give him the morning star. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. The morning star is the brightest star in the morning. Jesus said, I am the light of the world. Again, it's talking about Jesus. Jesus is saying, you're going you're gonna to receive my light. You're going to receive my wisdom. You're going to have authority over all the nations. Why is that so important? Because the people that this was written to, they're hiding in dark, dark caves for their life. They're losing loved ones that are being executed for being a Christian, for spreading the word of God. And it's like they're in the dark, and you say, well, Christians are going to win, but these Christians, and John is saying, listen, you hang in there. You spread my word. Keep the faith, even in your suffering, because the day is coming. You're going to have authority. You're not going to be hiding in caves anymore. You're going to be in charge with me. And when it says rule with the rod of iron, that's not a billy club that we're going to be ruling. There'll, there'll be no unbelievers. There'll be no troublemakers. You won't have to protect yourself. In the Greek, it's a shepherd's rod. And the point is, we're going to have authority. God's going to rule us with grace. We will rule each other with grace. And even during the millennial kingdom, and that's another sermon, we will rule with grace. So we will receive the light of life. Number five, another reward, the book of life. The book of life. If you're an overcomer, you're a conqueror, your name is in God's book of life. Revelation 3, 5, and, the, and to the one who conquers will be clothed thus in white garments, and I will never blot his name out of the book of life. I will confess his name before my father and before his angels. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. Now it says, I will never blot his name out of the book of life. That's not a threat. Some people look at that as a threat. It's a promise. He's saying, I will never blot your name out. If your name's in there, God's not going to erase it. He'll never do it. It's eternal security. I don't know how people get that and come up with this doctrine that God's got this giant eraser and ready to erase your name every time you do something wrong. Your righteousness is in Christ and in Christ alone. You can't work for it and you can't work your way out of it. It's, it's the grace of Jesus Christ. So your name is in God's book. And that means you're special to him. And he even says, I'll, I'll confess you before my father. It's like Jesus says, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to introduce you to my father. You know, Frank, come over here. I want you to meet my father. Angels gather around here. That's awesome. I want, you to, I want you to see an overcomer. This guy conquered. All because he put his faith in me. He's my child. Welcome him. Welcome him to the kingdom of heaven. Number six. The sixth reward. We receive the secure life. Man, man wouldn't it be great if we lived someplace safe? Someplace secure, that place is coming. Revelation 3, 12, to the one who conquers, 
I will make him a pillar in the temple of my God. Never shall he go out of it. And I will write on him the name of my God and the name of the city of my God, the new Jerusalem, which comes down from my God out of heaven and my own new name. There it is. Special relationship with each of us. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. Not only is God have your name written in his book of life, but he's just writing your name all over heaven. He's saying that if you are an overcomer, you believe in Christ, he's saying that the city is yours. You will, you will be a pillar there. You will be secure there. No one will ever take you from it. And we will be secure and safe in God's kingdom in the new Jerusalem and the new heaven. And seven, and finally, I love this one. Call this the throne of life. The throne of life. Revelation 3 again. To the one who conquers... I will grant him to sit with me on my throne as I also conquered and sat down with my father on his throne. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. <laughs> now, think about that. What ancient king would let somebody sit on their throne? It wouldn't happen. It wouldn't happen. But here the king of kings says not all. He, doesn't, he doesn't say, you know, there are other places what it says we'll sit on thrones, symbolic of, of the, the royalty as children of God, yes. But he's saying, he's saying you'll sit on my throne. You, you're going to crawl up in my lap, and I'm going to hold you there because he loves you that much. So if you think, you think you're sitting in the back road, oh, no, you're not. You're going to be crawling up on that throne, having a special relationship with, with the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and it with heaven being all lit up. It's just so awesome. God loves us that much, and I really believe God is, God looks forward to that day when we're there, and he can finally give us full salvation where we're in his presence and we're not afraid anymore and there's no more death no more fear this is what he has coming for an overcomer are you an overcomer do you believe in Jesus with your heart you're going to be there I use this illustration all the time because it just means so much to me when my kids were little I used to take them to the car wash, and they were scared of the car wash. You know that car wash with all the things that wheels that spin around and wash your car? And they were scared of it. And I really didn't want them to be as scared, but, but I'll tell you what I did. I let them out of their car seats, and they would come, and they would crawl up in my lap. And I didn't like them being afraid, but I sure loved them in my lap. Miss those days when they're little. Now they're grown up, taking care of little ones themselves. But it, what a joy it was to me to hold them and comfort them. And just in that moment, have a relationship with them to let them know dad loves you. God loves us so much more than we love our own children, than we love our own grandchildren. And God's just looking for that day. And some, like I said, some of our fears... Some of our hurts and pains push us. God's saying, trust me, crawl up in my lap. Right now, you're going to have to do it spiritually. You're going to have to trust me. You're going to have to pray. You're going to have to memorize scripture. Stay with Christians. Encourage one another. This life is hard. But take heart, I've overcome the world. But the day will come when you'll sit on my throne and we will have fellowship for all of eternity. That's good news. That's better than the Moose Club. That's better than the Moose Club. It's the kingdom of Jesus Christ. Would you bow? Let's pray with me.